okay, this is working. All right, um, I gotta tell you guys right now, I don't, I haven't really uh, talked in front of people before. Uh, so you are guinea pigs for this experiment. Um, I'm gonna sweat, uh, stammer. Thank God I don't have to hold a microphone because um, I'll wave my arms a lot. Um, but essentially, uh, hi. Hello. <laughs> my name is uh, Chris Glass. And when people ask me what I do, I say as little as possible. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of truth to that, but the, the funny thing is it takes a, a lot of work to do as little as possible. So um, uh, what I really do is I'm a designer. And uh, when you break that down, I essentially, I make things. Um, most folks know me uh, and my partners at work for our t-shirts that we make. Uh, I also spend my days making icons, um, logos, one of which we've uh, seen referenced here already today. Uh, I help design apps and emblems and websites. And I take photos every day. And just recently I started making videos, um, which are really fun to do. So when I started thinking about, okay, I'm giving a presentation, I started reading a book and it said, just give facts, give information. Um, you don't really wanna to be too heavy on the personal story. So that really scared me. Um, what you're gonna to see today is my personal story. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, within that, you'll be able to get a, a sense of uh, some of my inspiration. You know, kind of how did I get in front of you? How do I stand before you? A little bit of my experiences, and then I'm going to go off on some tangents as well. Um, I was born and raised in New Richmond, Ohio, which is about 30 minutes uh, uh, away from downtown Cincinnati. Uh, I should also mention that I was really excited about all the transitions in Keynote, so I'm going to be trying to use them all <laughs> in this presentation. So, um, New Richmond is a little uh, small river town. Uh, I think we have two stoplights at the time. And um, I lived on a farm, a 100-acre farm, with my family. And that's me there, the little one. And uh, my parents were very creative. We had 100 acres, we didn't really have neighbors, so we really had to entertain ourselves a lot. My dad was an engineer, a machinist. He started an um, engineering company in Williamsburg, Ohio, and they machined parts. He got a lot of patents for things like uh, a, a double-edged log splitter, um, a diesel fuel-saving device. Um, he was a funny guy, he loved cars, um, and he was always trying to get the latest technology, whatever it was, whether it was uh, a doorbell that played music that you could change uh, through a programming pad or what have you. And my mom, she's still around, and she's what I would consider an artist. Uh, she does a lot of different things. Uh, she, I remember her growing up, and she was a calligrapher. She was always making stuff. Um, she was a reader. She was always cooking new things. You know, we had pesto in the 70s, which was unheard of out in New Richmond, Ohio. <laughs> and then she also was a business owner, starting an um, uh, antique store in New Richmond. So we, we were a creative family, and where I found uh, my initial step into creativity, it started with crayons. Um, I wasn't very good at the time. This is my... Uh, drawing of Johnny Bench. Um, but for some reason at the time, I, I just thought that I want to be an artist when I grow up. And so my parents, being the very supportive people that they were, they sent me to classes at the Art Academy in Cincinnati. And these were just weekend classes, and I would go every week and learn how to draw stipple and crosshatch and use pencils and printing and all of these different things. And as much as I loved the classes, there was my favorite part, which was at the end of each class, uh, I got to go to the art uh, museum store and buy a book. And the books that were available, the only ones I wanted were from this guy named Ed Emberley. And he had these books called Make a World. And they were fascinating to me because essentially, if you could draw these shapes, you could draw anything. So, you know, he's got a series of books. There's, 
you know, this one is make a world, so it's kind of everything all together, but there was everything green, everything purple, everything orange. But essentially, the whole concept of these books is kind of genius, and I still use the concepts today, which is you, you see something that you want to make, and then you break it down into the smallest parts that you can to achieve that. And, I mean, I'm still kind of baffled at the simplicity of it and the beauty of it and the geometry. So through this, I learned how to break things down. This pirate ship, I think I spent many a day trying to make that over and over and over. Eventually I did. And this idea of breaking things down and building them up was something that was common in childhood. You know, it was something that you saw in um, Lego, which was another big, I was a big fan of that. Um, so there was all this idea of making things and building, and then all of a sudden, you know, I was old enough to go to movies, and then I wanted to be a puppeteer. So I was just amazed when Kermit rode his bike across the screen, and it was just this magic that I couldn't understand. Um, how was it possible that this could happen? Um, technology evolved, and then I wanted to work in the movies. It was pretty clear that this was... Uh, um, I don't know, it just drew my attention more than anything else. But I think what I actually wanted to be was, I wanted to be E.T. I didn't actually want to be in the movies. Um, and thanks to my mom and McCall's pattern 8311, <laughs> I was actually able to become E.T. Um, what's funny is she, she had this pattern and uh, I just asked her to go get it out for me so I could photograph it. And I'm like, Mom, did you have to cut that pattern and lengthen it so it would work for me? And she's like, yeah. So there I was, the world's tallest <laughs> E.T. Um, and there's my mom way in the background, you know, kind of looking proudly on as I'm about to go probably scare other kids during trick-or-treating. Um, so the next phase of my life, pretty much 1979 through 1983, <laughs> all I wanted to do was pilot uh, the Millennium Falcon. Um, I wanted to get on a speeder bike. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, be in an ATST. I'm not sure if that's how you say it. Um, and so that was a, a, a really big part of my life. And it's funny, all well, my friends that have kids now, it's a big part of theirs as well. And it's funny to see that cycle uh, continue. What I would do is I would draw characters from Star Wars and photograph them or um, uh, photocopy them, and then try to sell them on the street in front of my dad's <laughs> office. <clears throat> and I think he and my mom actually sent friends that I didn't know to buy these, these drawings. Um, so that was really sweet of them. Um, but things were about to change again. In 1985, the Nintendo Entertainment System came out, and I was bowled over. It was probably the most amazing thing. And that controller is probably one of the best interfaces ever designed in the entire world, ever. Um, so I would sit for hours in front of the TV, probably way too close, trying to understand how is this magic happening and how am I controlling it? You know, it was no longer this passive, I'm watching a movie. I'm actually controlling what is on this screen. And what I found was that, you know, this whole world that I was drawn into was made up of pixels. So um, it was kind of interesting that at this time also technology was evolving and Amiga computers were out. And so I was able to plot and recreate Donkey Kong Jr. and Mario and, and plot these out as kind of an artistic medium. And it's that point where I really learned how to mimic, you know, where you see something and you just imitate it so you can get a feel for it and, and try it on. Make, make sure you understand what it does and, and how you can do it yourself. Um, so this continued into high school. So I'm growing up and totally into music. You know, cause singles, cassettes, CDs, all of that. You know, I'm drawing, you know, all of the band names from the album covers on pieces of paper and, and trying to understand typography and color and just really getting into it. So it was, um, this is probably, you know, the next slide will really indicate um, why I wasn't good at math. So then I started to make my own stuff. So I started to kind of explore, 
you know, creating my own type and what does it mean? Oh, by the way, this big swatch right there of, that's drool. <laughs> And that was from math class in high school. So um, that explains a lot and probably why I'm horrible at CSS. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, also in high school, I wrote a paper on what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I wanted to be a commercial artist. And you can't see all the red marks here, but it wasn't a very well written paper. Um, but it was kind of interesting that I had this notion of graphics and art and merging them in a way that was less expressionistic and more of an endeavor. Um, so I found myself going to The Ohio State University. And um, it's, I'm also known as a period of time when I'm really glad there weren't digital cameras and Facebook. So it was a very awkward phase for me, I was even more awkward phase for me. Um, so on my first day of class, I met this chick named Wendy. And uh, we were both enrolled in an art class, and we were you know, going through the, the motions, learning how to draw contour. And both of us had this idea that we would go into the design program. Uh, after the first week, she disappeared. And I was freaked out. And I'm like, oh, gosh, she was one of the people I liked. I don't know, what did I do? Um, the next week, I saw her in the hallway. And she's like, yeah, I switched over to this other class. This guy is more, he's more challenging. This is a much better class. You should join me. So I did. So uh, we took Art 101 with this uh, teacher named Mike Arrigo. And I'll never forget him because the first thing that I did when I got into his class is he said, fill your paper with charcoal. Just completely black it all in. And I want you to draw this. And I, I give him credit. That's pretty crazy. And I have no idea what he was, where he was going with this. Um, but I was intrigued. And you know, that's you know, one of the, the hooks of teaching is to, um, to get someone intrigued. So he had this projected on a screen, much like we have right here. But then he would say, OK, now take out your erasers, and I'm going to readjust the focus. And so he stepped it down another notch. So we did that for another 15 minutes or so, maybe 10, I'm not sure. And he would do it again and again. So ultimately, what we were doing is subtractively creating this this drawing. But what I learned from this was really how to re-see the world, um, and that is to squint. Um, and by doing that, you're essentially breaking things down into shapes that are, you know, they're devoid of the meaning that you've ascribed to them. Um, so all of a sudden, you're looking at that Edinburgh drawing book and looking at triangles and circles and squares. So that was Art 101, and it really changed the way that I see things. And I still to this day squint quite a lot, but sometimes it's for other reasons. Um, so I pursued a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Design with a focus in visual communications, which is a ridiculously long way to say graphic designer. But what's kind of interesting about the program at Ohio State at this time is that it was a Bachelor of Science. It was not a Bachelor of Arts program. And I particularly was proud of this and really liked it because it took away that idea of, you know, this is about, I don't know, expressing my inner darkness or, you know, anything. It was science. This design stuff is science. It's a process that you can apply to things to achieve a result. So I went through school and, uh, you know, we went through a variety of things. What you'll find, uh, except for the uh, upper right hand corner, everything we did, we did by hand. So. I did some cartooning. Uh, I took a photography class. There's my little pensive shot. Um, made some logos over there, uh, explorations and typography. Looked at product design. Essentially, industrial design had three arms, product design, interior space, and visual communications. Uh, I found myself drawn to visual communications, so I went down that path. While all of my classmates were learning how to make stationary and um, packaging and, uh, you know, they were just kind of gearing up for their senior project. I wanted to make a CD-ROM and none of my teachers had the knowledge to let me do that. So I learned how to use Macromedia Director at the time. It was called something else. Um, so I created a CD-ROM uh, for my, my senior project. I'm going to back up a little bit here. Um, I also went to Switzerland my last year in college, and you'll see just even just in this one slide, there's a little bit of shift in my, my design style. What I found 
really most amazing about Switzerland, again, it was a program without computers, um, was the, the sheer beauty of the environment and the respect that they give to it. You know, you don't see billboards when you're in Switzerland. Switzerland, you see posters that are arranged around the town in very meaningful ways. It's all very logical. Everything folds up into itself. It's quite beautiful, and there's a, a simplicity that really kind of rubbed off on me. And it really informed how I look at things and um, how you can really strip things down to get to their core essence and communicate a message. You know, it's a little bit like wayfinding, um, but it, it, it's a little bit more. So I traveled around while I was in, um, overseas. I started drawing more, and I graduated. And I had one life goal. And that was I didn't want to work weekends. <laughs> I'd been doing it uh, pretty much through high school. Uh, I'd been working a couple jobs at a time just to get through school and pay for the design supplies and CDs and beer and a bike and things like that. Um, and I was very lucky that right after I graduated, I got a job making CD-ROMs. And where I just wanted to have my weekends off, I now had a computer at my disposal, a computer that I could take home and learn from. So all of a sudden, this toolbar became my weekends, but it didn't feel like a job. <clears throat> Photoshop at the time was very similar to what it is today with a lot fewer features. I sometimes wish they would have just stayed right there. Um, but during this time, I grew immensely in terms of understanding how design is more than just what you're putting on a page. It's a story that you're telling somebody. Um, so some of the first works that I did, this is for Bartlett's familiar quotations. It's a CD-ROM of really just uh, a bunch of quotes you know, that you can navigate through different tabs. I started to understand how I could kind of take that knowledge from Switzerland of iconography and start to apply it into interface. <clears throat> What's kind of interesting about CD-ROMs is they're a fixed size, 640 by 480. And it seems so tidy now to have this one canvas to, and with which to paint. It feels a little bit like iPads, but um, it's, it's different. So I made a bunch of CD-ROMs. And I did this for two years intensely, um, working with different clients and understanding um, what it was they were trying to communicate, and to wrap it up in a visual language that was easy to parse quickly. Um, I think that's one of the, my favorite things about being a designer, is working with different groups and organizations and finding out problems that they're trying to understand and different ways to communicate it and to illustrate it. So this is not the most exciting screen of a, a mapping software that had you could install a GPS on your tractor You know, back in 90. Six. This was pretty far out, but it would measure the soil as you were going, and you could make maps and, and farm better. Worked on programs where you could spin the body around and start to de delve down in different layers. Um, worked on a CD-ROM for the Air and Space Museum about fighter planes. And this whole idea of meaning in design, you know, it can be very subtle. You know, the curve of those buttons over there references the curves of the plane itself, the planes themselves. This is probably one of my proudest uh, pieces from this period of time, and for reasons that are totally not visible at all. But I don't know if anybody's familiar with Quick Cams. I think Apple Quick Cams at the beginning it was like 640 by 480 pictures, digital. You could you could make. I printed out columns on a laser printer. I cut them off on cardboard, and I took a picture of it, and then that became the interface for this. So this idea of kind of reaching out into the wor real world to make digital things kind of became a signature of how I like to make things. So I mentioned one of the, the, the greatest things that I learned from this, this particular job. My, my boss, Robert Abbott, uh, taught me about semantics. And when you have meaning, you have truth. I really haven't figured out this slide yet. But essentially, um, when you have meaning, you can really defend yourself in a meeting. You know, if somebody says, oh, add a texture behind that. And you're like, well, why? What does it mean? If it's a meaningful texture, then it's really easy to support it and to really incorporate it and feel confident about it. So this idea of semantics really hadn't stuck in with me until I'd worked here and really applied it on real-world projects. But all of a sudden, CD-ROMs got really not as interesting. I mean, it was just kind of a switch just happened. And it was because of this thing called the internet. 
So all of a sudden, this thing that I had to commit to a, a physical disk and like deliver and put out the door and into a box was really unappealing. Um, it felt like print all of a sudden, where I couldn't just fiddle with stuff constantly. Uh, it was very committed, and though there is beauty in that, um, it, uh, it didn't feel as exciting. What I wanted to do was I wanted to make websites. So I got with a friend from high school, and we bought this book, The Idiot's Guide to Starting Your Own Business. Um, and aside from their horrible book covers, um, it, uh, it's a valuable Bible when you're starting a company. I mean, first you have to make a business plan. What are you going to do? How are you going to make it? How are you going to pay for that? How much is it going to cost? You have to get incorporated. Um, you have to get health care. You know, there's all these things that you have to uh, figure out. And uh, this really puts it into logical steps. So we did that. We actually traced the, the title of the book. And we made, because we were running out of time and we had to go incorporate. So we, uh, we came up with the name Idio from the Idiot's Guide to Starting Your Own Business. Um, and actually, TS, it's Idiots. Yeah, well, that was us. Um, so great. We were incorporated. We had a pretty silly name. Um, but we didn't have any clients, and we didn't know how to make websites, but that's what we wanted to do. So because we didn't have a portfolio, I figured the best thing I could do was to make a personal website. So I made this timeline, and that way I was able to show the work that I had done in my previous job in kind of a, a nice way without saying, this is our company. So it really became a point where I would just you know, contact people and say, hey, I'm a web designer, we've got a company, we're making websites, what can we do? Um, this part of my website is actually still up online. I've just put it into a little tab there called Timeline. Um, I'm not a fan of throwing things away. I, I really feel that it's important to hold on to everything that we make and to put it out there in warts and all. So yes, this was made with tables. Um, it's, it's horribly coded. Um, it doesn't fit browser windows right anymore, but it's there and I'm really proud of it and what it represented. So I'll keep it around for a while. So still, nobody was taking. We, we still didn't really know how to make a website other than this. So we found a brochure called The Guide to Public Art in Cincinnati. And we asked the publisher um, if we could put that online. And she had no idea what we were talking about. And all the, color, all the photos were in black and white. And we're like, well, this is the web. We can do color. It's free. Um, so. <laughs> We went around town and we took photos of all the public art that was in Cincinnati at the time, which was a lot less than it is now, uh, thank goodness. Um, and we made this website. And from there, we really kind of honed our chops into understanding you know, how to FTP, essentially. I mean, they were really basic things that we didn't know how to do. One of the things that kind of came down the pike that we were really lucky with was Sun Microsystems uh, had a contest to redesign their homepage. So we submitted this. And you can't see it, um, but there's rollovers. That was amazing at the time. So you would roll over these, these boxes, and it would give you sub-navigation items. And we just thought it was the neatest thing ever, and it was totally cool and awesome. And so did Sun. So we started working with a character there named uh, Jacob Nielsen. And he introduced another word into my lexicon, which was usability, something I hadn't really thought about before in all of my teaching and, and design. Um, we never really had to think about how is the user going to parse what it is that you're doing and how are you going to make it better? How are you going to make it easy? So it was a really radical shift in understanding, okay, well, you know, in design school I learned how to draw things with a straight line and cut with an exacto and typography and spacing and all of those basic things. After that I learned in the real world you need to know semantics and you should be able to back up whatever it is that you're making. And then beyond that, to really find success, you have to have usability on your side. You have to really think about it and consider it while you're doing things. So I felt very, very lucky to be able to work with Jacob and understand this uh, really kind of important concept of making websites. So we started making websites. And we made a ton of them. And um, it was uh, a really great time. So these are just some examples of uh, some of the sites that made around town. Some of them kind of branched outside of Cincinnati. It's kind of funny to see how small everything looks now. It even looks small on your phone. Um, 
worked with local organizations and really tried to establish and develop a language that was a little bit different than what was going on at the web at the time, which was huge layers of junk. And I'm sad to, I mean, I think we all know this, it's still there. <laughs> um, so it's kind of our job as you know, designers and developers to kind of raise flags and say, you know, all of a sudden that article that I'm trying to read is the smallest thing on this page. So kept developing sites really starting to, to move into like e-commerce. Um, and then we had a slow period. 2001 happened and everything was a little bit, you know, vague for a while. Um, I had hired friends uh, from college. Uh, Wendy, actually, the one that uh, uh, taught me to get into the, or told me to get into the art, art class. She was one of my first employees. And I don't really say that she was my employee as much as I say we worked together. It was a really great time. Um, but uh, most, of the, uh, most of the girls that we were working with, it was time to start families, and it was just a really natural time to start disbanding. So I continued to still want to make websites, but at this time it was just people were reticent to invest, and it was just really hard to find work. So what I did was I kind of uh, took a step back and I looked at, well, where would I really like to work? And I found this company uh, out in Wyoming uh, called Knowles, the National Outdoor Leadership School. I mean, essentially, it's, a, it's a, a school that has, you know, uh, courses all around the world for horse packing and climbing mountains and kayaking and doing all this sporty stuff that I, I wasn't good at but I always wanted to do. But there was just a coolness about them that I, I felt really drawn to. So I actually wrote a book about what they could do with their website to make it better. And I didn't hear back from them for a year. And then a year later, I got a call from the, the, the president of the company, and he said, I, where's, I love this. Let's do this. So they flew me out to Wyoming, and I did it. And so, you know, it was kind of existing on my own, making websites. And it was, uh, it was a harder period of time. And, but it, uh, it, there was also something else that was, wrong, that was wrong. You know, I don't know if it was fatigue or if that websites were never finished, but just something didn't feel right. All of a sudden, maybe I longed for those CD-ROMs uh, where you could commit and people couldn't mess with it and it was pure and it was your expression of what you were doing. So it was time to try something new. So Wendy had married this fellow named Tom. That's him right there. Um, and we both had a love of me. Actually, here's a better picture of him. Um, <laughs> He's here, so I hope he really appreciates this. Um, we both had a love of music and design. We have very, very different styles. Um, you know, we loved going to concerts and buying T-shirts and buying records, and you know, we shared a lot of things in, in common. And we decided, just uh, you know, kind of on a whim, let's get a screen printing press. And we had no idea what we were doing, but it was fun. It was not a pixel. It was not uh, something that was designed by committee. It was this thing that we could make and we could commit and we could put onto fabric or paper and it was done and it was pure and it was ours. So it took us a while. We, uh, we, we ruined a lot of things. Um, we uh, finally, uh, we, we got it working uh, in the basement of Tom and Wendy. Uh, we were able to get a press going and start making things that actually lined up the colors. Um, so this is one of our first prints. And uh, our first company, we, we were like, hey, this is exciting. Let's make a company and let's just do this. And so we were like, green cow, let's be green cow because we're out on a farm and, um, you know, it sounds kind of cool. Well, uh, we found out that there's a lot of colored cow companies. <laughs> so it was a really bad idea. So we decided to call, call ourselves Wire and Twine. And we did that because we were out in this, you know, hay field. Um, you know, there's two different ways to bale hay. One is with wire and one is with twine. And we thought that that played nicely into, you know, kind of what our approach to, to work was, which is it's going to have a digital component, but it's also going to have a bit of humanity to it. It's going to have something analog. Um, it might get a little bit messy. So we decided to, you know, do this thing. So we made a website. Like, we literally made a website um, <laughs> by hand. And it was, uh, it was, uh, I guess it was 2006, we actually launched our first site. 
and we had exactly seven products. Um, but it was a very exciting time for us. Um, you can't really see this design here, but the, the brown shirt there says Flourish. We had this idea there was a lot of t-shirts out there and they were all kind of snarky and we just kind of wanted to be on the up and up. We wanted uh, our products to reflect the things that we loved, the things that we thought were fun, um, <clears throat> the things that you know were, we deemed awesome. So the first product that I made was uh, a shirt about beards. Um, so it uh, had a little key down at the bottom so you can understand you know, what each beard was. And uh, you know, seven years ago, this was unheard of. Now, beards are finally in. So <laughs> we're obviously not, we're not timing ourselves very well. Um, so we started making fun stuff, stuff that just we enjoyed. Um, this t-shirt, enjoy this beautiful day. Um, it was just a, a simple message that um, it's kind of fun when you actually wear this shirt, you have a little bit of a brighter day because people walk by and they're smiling. And even if it is, is a little bit rainy, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice respite. So, you know, we're like, okay, well, what else can we make? What do we, what do we dig? And I'm like, well, I really like Cincinnati. I'm born and raised here. It's an awesome city. It's filled with awesome different communities. Um, what can I do with all of those? So I just took all of the names of all the different places in Cincinnati and I threw it on a piece of paper. And all of a sudden it started to make sense that, hey, this kind of makes a map. Um, so we made the Cincinnati transit map for optimists. And that was our, <laughs> our next. So by this time, we were actually finding a little bit of success. Our shirts were selling. Um, both online and we had started selling at MICA over in oh, Mount Lookout, I believe it was, uh, wherever they first started. So all of a sudden that basement wasn't really suiting our needs. There was a lot of fumes from the printing. So we moved out to uh, Tom and Wendy's work, work, workshop, which was uh, originally for woodworking and music. Um, but we pushed all of that aside. We set up uh, ventilation and we built a dark room and we started making more shirts. And it would seem at this point in time when we became the t-shirt company that made shirts about Cincinnati, um, which was a really actually pretty awesome thing to do. Uh, it was fun. This one's called Cincinnati by the numbers and uh, probably all of it makes sense, but this one at the lower left might be the one that doesn't make sense. It's toothpicks and there's 246 of them. If anybody's figured that one out. And if anyone has any better ideas, I'd totally replace that block and reprint this. Um, so we also made another t-shirt made in Ohio. Um, and this was probably our first bona fide hit where, you know, we've been kind of playing this over and over. It's been loaded up on our screen so many times we keep having to burn more screens. Um, it's really popular in onesies, but uh, big people like it too. Um, so we keep making these things, you know, we keep trying to find stuff that we think is fun. And uh, we, we do it on our own schedule. We're, you know, some folks say that we're really slow. Um, that's the whole point of trying to do as little as possible. Um, but, you know, every once in a while inspiration strikes. Like the honey badger, for example. Um, when I saw that video, I just thought it was the silliest thing ever. And, you know, in an afternoon we had this t-shirt and, you know, it sold for a while. Thank goodness it's not selling as well now so we can retire it and move on to the next silly thing that will probably involve a cat. Um, so we've done well. Uh, our t-shirts sell online. We sell them in uh, a bunch of different places here around town. And uh, we've been at it for seven years. And I wouldn't say that we actually know what we're doing. We're still trying to figure it out, but we're getting better. Uh, we're getting much better with like saying no and timelines and you know, kind of honoring the, the creative process that we're trying to cultivate. And I know there's a lot of developers here. Um, just a side note and to entrepreneurs, if somebody can make a web tool where you can have an online store and then organize your inventory for online sales and retail sales and help organize or, you know, streamline fulfillment, make it, it will do well. We have nothing out there that does this. You know, there's Shopify, there's Etsy, there's, you know, all these different tools, but they all fall short. And this whole part of actually getting a product um, out the door and into somebody's hands through, 
you know, there's all these things are there. They're just separate. So anyway, I'm just saying if somebody does that, I will be your guinea pig. I will test it. I will design buttons, um, <laughs> whatever it takes. <clears throat> so I mentioned um, Ed Emberley. And uh, at some point in time, I started blogging and journaling, really, at the time. And, you know, it was this really great way to just kind of work through feelings and, you know, uh, put up pictures and, you know, kind of really find your voice. This was before Facebook, and it was a lot less volatile at the time. Um, so I posted about Ed Emberley, and just, you know, I didn't think anything of it. I reviewed, they republished his books, and they were of inferior quality to the originals, and, you know, every time I say anything negative online, it, it always comes back to bite me. So in this case, it actually bit quite well. So from this, uh, I met a character named Steve in, in Chicago. And at the time, we had just launched a t-shirt called 50 Ways to Help the Planet at Wire and & Twine. And so he kind of got a sense of my design language. And he said, hey, I'm working on a project that requires a, a logo, an emblem. Um, and icons would be a really great direction. So they partnered up, um, myself and a, a, another character named Aaron Draplin, who if you're a designer, you've probably heard of him. He's incredible. Um, and they kind of tasked both of us to design this emblem for the Obama administration and this um, new program that would inject money into the economy and hopefully, you know, get us out of a slump. So it was called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act at the time. It still is, but it's, that's the long legal political name that you really don't see. And so for Aaron, they said, you do eagles and stars and stripes and Americana and Chris, you do icons. And we want the icons to represent energy and health and education and um, a couple other things I'm spacing out on right now. So I started. Um, oh, technology. Uh, so uh, I started just, you know, oh, oh, here's another fun thing. We had a week. <laughs> and uh, it was crazy, to say the least. <clears throat> What's kind of fun is um, when you're in this situation, it is a competition in a way. Um, you know, Aaron was working on his stuff and I was working on mine, but each day we would get back together and we would review our work with the Chicago team and the White House. We didn't actually directly work with them, but... Um, so we got to kind of play off each other and really it became a team for this particular project. So I started to extrapolate the idea uh, of these icons a little bit more. I would then go back and make it kind of weird and nonsensical in a way. Um, different directions. I stole the idea that I could use an eagle from Aaron. Um, <clears throat> and then this, this idea just started to form of, you know, how do we kind of lock this all together? And so this one actually borrows largely from the Department of Homeland Security. But this is the one that had resonance. And essentially, the feedback was, put it in a circle and add some red. So I did. <laughs> and then Aaron cleaned it up and made it exceptional. Um, and it was kind of mind-blowing to see this happen, where this thing that you worked on for a week all of a sudden is on the TV. And then in a couple months, it was all over the road. And it is unfortunate that, you know, the best place to see this logo is, you know, when you are driving on uh, a highway when there's road construction. It's really hard to get a picture of it. Um, so, you know, a lot of people associate this emblem with uh, anger and, uh, um, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was pretty volatile, some of the feedback that we saw appear on the internet. Um, it was, uh, it was, uh, interesting, you know, to, to, to get all of the different perspectives from such a, a political beast. Um, but most emblems and logos aren't always quick like that. Sometimes they take a really long time, but they can also be um, uh, as divisive uh, with, with their, uh, the final product and how people view it. So because uh, there, I think there's a few nerds in the room, uh, I'll give us a, a glimpse here of Node and how it came to be. And this was a very long process. This took, you know, I don't know, four months. And it was, you know, just a, it was all about decisions and, and trying to understand, you know, everything that goes into it. But essentially, the command line prompt was the, the, the impetus, you know, that 
kind of crazy teal green of a flashing cursor was the first angle that we took. Um, and it went on. And it's like, okay, well, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try something else. Let's add color. Let's do this. Let's make the type different. And let's go on and on and on and on and on. And on and on for a while. But the result is quirky. It's a little bit different than um, a lot of the other technology companies out there. And it, it met with, from at least from my designer friends, a lot of, what's that? Um, is that rodeo? I can't read that. I have no idea what that's saying. Um, <laughs> But the, the fellow's grown, grown on me. And it's been awesome to see just the entire network of people that are using it and making really interesting stuff with it. And you know, part of working with uh, the, the team of Node uh, has been kind of getting a glimpse into, I see what is the parallel side of what I'm doing. It's a, a creativity of code. And I think that the magic of all of this stuff is when these two things are paired up. Um, it's very rare when you get them all in one mind, but when you can at least get two minds together, I think you find a beauty. So um, I still make logos, you know, um, and it's just a fun, uh, it's, a, it's a fun way to kind of express uh, a company or a brand and, you know, either help out a friend or a company or what have you. Um, in addition to t-shirts, I still make websites as well. Um, one of the first ones is Node. Um, and we should see something new here pretty soon. It'd be pretty cool. Um, uh, because I took photos and I put them on those journals, I met this character named Marilyn Mann, who, uh, who writes a, uh, wrote a blog called 43 Folders, and he's all about Inbox Zero, and he's eccentric and awesome. I'm, if, I hope nobody's counting my awesomes. Um, but uh, he really kind of opened me up to a whole new world of people and started sharing my work. And it, it led to greater and greater things. Come back to locally, I worked with Woxie.com. Um, this was a great marriage of music and the web and technology and streaming. They had just finished having their airwaves of radio for years and went strictly online for a while. Um, the tagline is a little bit sad now, the future of rock and roll, it's no longer. Um, but it was kind of fun to, uh, to make t-shirts for them. And all of a sudden, those doodles in high school uh, started to come back into play. And it was a, a really fun thing to do. So what I do now, uh, more than I did you know, when I was, dare I say, hungrier, but I really like to, to work on projects that are meaningful. Um, I like to make sure that I'm working with teams of people that care and appreciate each other. And it's these are the things that uh, really uh, make up the days. So I helped AIDS Lifecycle with their website. Uh, locally, we worked with Crossroads. Um, somehow, I met the, the girls from the breeders up in Dayton, and I started working with them. Through Merlin, I met this nerd, uh, Chris Hardwick, and I've been doing graphics for him for a while. And uh, the, uh, the, the people that run, or the, the people that, the stalwarts, is that the word, of uh, Node is joint, and I'm constantly working with them, and we change their homepage every week to something new. Um, I work on little projects. Matt Howey from Metafilter wanted, wanted to track his uh, mileage of his car, so we uh, freshened up this website. Some of the stuff I work on, actually, a lot of the stuff I work on, it doesn't exist and it's never going to exist. I like to work with people and uh, do that blue sky kind of thing, where what would this look like in 10 years or five years or three years? So this is what Amazon might look like in the future. Um, and this was mm, 2007, so it was before tablets and things like that. It would be really cool to play with this with your finger, I have, I have to say. In addition to websites, I've been really lucky to, um, to have friends ask me, hey, I'm starting up a tattoo store. Can you do a design? And so that was Tina uh, Swiss Miss up in New York. And I said, sure, of course I would. And so I made up uh, a tattoo for my mom because she's my anchor. And, you know, she's, uh, <clears throat> it was weird. You know, it didn't really make sense. And it just felt right. So I did it. <laughs> um, so uh, I mentioned how I like to do things uh, in the real world and then bring them back into digital. Um, that happened with the, my friends up there. 
in Dayton. They needed an album cover, so I went to Michael's and I bought these, uh, these cardboard letters, and we made an album. And I don't just, um, you know, do graphic design all day with my partner Tom at work. We also made an album. Um, we, uh, it was a challenge. Friends of ours were having, um, uh, and I'm, I'm seeing I'm going by on time really fast, so anyway, he asked if there could be kittens, and I said yes. <laughs> so one of the proudest things that I do that I don't get paid for um, is I take daily photos. And it all started on April 1st, 2003. I was at a gas pump, and I was just trying to remember what to, to journal about that evening, you know, because it's really important stuff, like how I don't like the numbers to match up when I finish pumping my gas. Otherwise, I won't have a lucky day. So, so I started this, and I found that I really like to make with the camera. Um, and being the, the kind of the designer, you know, that I am, I had to make up rules. And the rules were, I had to take at least one picture every day to represent the day. It didn't have to be of that day, but it could just represent that day. And the other is that I would post photos in order. I would never skip ahead, um, even if there was a great delay. And if anybody's looked at my website, that great delay is about January 27th of this year. So I'm really behind. <clears throat> and there is no third rule. Uh, one of the ways that I uh, am able to do this is I keep very organized. I don't use any programs, I use folders. I name those folders by the day, and then I archive it three different ways. You know, three different hard drives is just, this is a great way for me to get through things. And I found that I really enjoyed photography, but I didn't really like it as art. And I was really liked, I, I like this quote by Jörg Kohlberg, and he said, when you look at what commonly is called fine art photography, it always comes with a statement, which contains some sort of explanation or motivation behind the photography. You never get to see something like, I just wanted to take some beautiful photos. And that's all I wanted to do, and that's all I want to do. I just enjoy it. I don't like doing it for money. I've done weddings. I sweat even more. It's, it's not pretty. So I take a lot of photos. In 2003, I took uh, about 4,000, and I'm up to about oh, 27,000 a year. Um, mind you, most of these are really bad photos, um, and I have no shame in that. I mean, some days are very mundane. Um, some days rock. Uh, some days you just don't even know. You know, it's just whatever, whatever I can get with my phone. And folks say, uh, you know, hey, I don't see too many pictures of you, um, but the truth is I'm in every picture that I take. I'm in that spot and it brings me back immediately. And so I see myself in the reflection of the faces and of the, of the, of the subjects themselves. So what do I take photos of? Cats <laughs> and dogs and trees and cars and signs. And if you haven't been to the sign museum in Cincinnati that just moved, go take the tour. It's in Mount Wash, uh, no, Camp Washington. So good. Um, I take pictures of the barns, of things in bathrooms, like this free cowboy hat dispenser. Uh, I take pictures of music, of weird stuff. Um, by tags, these are most, my most popular subjects. Awesome, which I say way too much. Um, beer, um, blue skies, California, Camp Washington. Um, so anyway, here's my process. I keep my camera set to automatic. I don't understand math, and that's what manual means, and I avoid it. I also avoid flash. Essentially, when I'm looking through the camera, I try to use the rule of thirds, which is to divide up the frame into thirds, and either you put something in the middle of those thirds or on those lines. If you do that, you're going to probably have a good picture. But the reality is I probably just center it. I center everything. And the reason I do this is because I can just take the picture, I don't have to think about it, and I can get on with life. Um, this is not uh, a vocation, it's a joy. Uh, so I've learned a lot from taking photos. You know, my friend Ann once said, you know, she's always doing something. I'm like, Ann, how, how do you do all this stuff? And you know, aren't you just tired? And she said, well, if you stop saying yes, uh, people will eventually stop asking you to do things. So when people ask me to do things like, hey, do you want to go to Vietnam and Southeast Asia? I say yes. Um, I say yes a lot. Probably too much. Um, uh, I've also learned to ignore feedback. If you're counting uh, your, your work by the likes that you're getting, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. It should be you know, at its purest for you. And some days are annoying, but you have to take the picture anyway. And you shouldn't stress about it. 
And you shouldn't think too much about, oh, I didn't get a picture that day. Just think about what that day was about and then take a picture to represent it. You know, when I spend any time thinking about uh, the good part of the day, I sleep better. That whole part of looking through your photos and whittling and reflecting is therapeutic. It's, it's, uh, it's my television. You know, I like to fiddle with, with photos. If you go to my website and look at the album, you can roll over the pictures and you can see a before and after. And the reason I do that is it's fun, because um, it's fun to fiddle. Um, but I think it's also disingenuous not to show the process, to, to make it seem like every photo comes out a winner. You know, with a little bit of fiddling, uh, you know, any photo can look good, probably. I think Instagram has proved that. Um, so the other thing I learned was always carry a camera. Um, it also uh, reminded me to be a tourist in your own city, which I have to say, um, when I started this, I thought Cincinnati was pretty great. And seven years later, I think it's a really great city. I mean, there's so many things to do here that it's, it's easy to be a tourist now. There's really no excuse for it. And so by taking photos and, and kind of organizing them for yourself or for others, it's totally worth it. Um, I got this fortune cookie, and so rarely do they actually mean anything. Um, to be able to look back upon one's past life with satisf satisfaction is to live twice, and I really find that to be the case. Um, so that's the bit about photos. And so I mentioned that there would be some tips, so I'm going to show, just close this all up with some helpful things I've learned over the years. The first is to honor grazing. Um, you know, if we think about the creative process as a line, and this isn't mine, I don't have my notes, but it'll come at the end. If we think about uh, uh, the process as a creative line, this is the part where we measure creativity. This is your website, this is your app, this is your code, this is what is tangible. But there's this whole other part of the line, that's the invisible part, and that's where you're thinking about what you're going to be doing. That's where you're visualizing and kind of managing things in your head and you're trying to figure out how can I solve this problem. And a lot of times when you have a manager or you're working with somebody and they don't honor this part of the process, um, it's kind of a bummer, you know? Uh, so, you know, we have to allow time without immediate concrete evidence of productivity for the miracle of creativity to occur. And it's something we really have to honor. So, you know, my summation of this is, you know, go out in the field and chew some cud and relax about it. It's all going to be okay. It's part of the process. Uh, this is uh, from a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball by Gordon McKenzie. It is fantastic. Every page of it, I recommend you pick it up. Another thing that I, were, uh, I found through um, my experience was this process from Amazon. And I read about it, and I, I thought it made a lot of sense. Well, it's to work backwards. So when Amazon launches a new product, um, when they get their teams together, the first thing that they do is they write the press release. And that helps you to understand what are we making? Who is it for? You know, what is it going to do? What is it going to solve? What's going to make it different? And it's a really great place to start. And then the next thing they do is they write the FAQs. They answer all the questions that might occur. So for the development process, they have a map of, of bugs to squash even, if you think of it that way. The third thing is then they start to look at the interface and the customer experience. And then the last part is to write the user manual. So this whole idea of working backwards and looking at you know, your value, the thing that you want to make, it's much easier to, to mitigate the process. So in other words, visualize your desired future, future in tangible ways. Right now, I'm visualizing a beer. <laughs> um, make obvious mistakes. Um, the reason you should do this is because if you have some work and a client sees that mistake, they're going to glom onto that, and they're going to forget all the other things that you want them to be looking at. So for example, color or fonts or anything, they're going to be focused on the typo in that headline. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm getting a lot now are, are metrics. Um, and you know, design with metrics, make, make decisions based on metrics. And I do feel like that's a, a really um, solid way to go about things. But not everything can be measured with metrics. There are no metrics for awesome. And I throw that out to the marketing folks now that I work with, and they get a chuckle out of it. Um, if you get stuck, get a haircut. Um, I always find that it lightens the load and uh, it, uh, it helps, uh, you know, 
get over that hump. Clean your desk. Um, this, uh, this was my desk a, a couple years or some time ago. And I had all this stuff that I collected that I loved hanging above my desk and it was just clutter, it was noise. Um, but what I decided to do was take it all down, put it into a box, take it home, and I decoupaged it. Um, so I was able to tidy it up and it gave me something to do. And uh, it made me able to work better, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, also, if you find shoes you really, really like, buy three pairs. Um, there's no shame in it at all. It's really important. So that's going forward. And uh, as for what's next, um, I mentioned I like to take cat photos. So in the fall, I'll be part of this book, uh, Little Bub's uh, Extraordinary Life of Ma the Most Amazing Cat on the Planet. I would love to show you some of the photos, but we have to wait. Um, but I think uh, you'll dig them. Um, so where am I going to go from here? I have no idea. I still want to be a, a puppeteer and film movies and take photos and create a video game and make apps and art and websites and update my blog. I need to do that and cook and get beefy. Um, <laughs> but essentially, um, I want to do as much as possible and I hope you guys too do too. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. I can help you learn how to get beefy. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we're going to just stay where we're at just for a couple minutes while we get the next speaker set up. So, oh, okay, well, we're behind time, but that's okay. All right, then be quiet, Kevin. All right. Oh, I got to walk no. all the way back over here. So, uh, where am I at? Okay. First of all, I'm a huge fanboy. I follow Chris all over the place. The Transit Map t-shirt, one of my favorite things. It's all holy and trash. <laughs> Second, he also made our local JavaScript user group logo, which he didn't mention for some reason, even though it's totally <laughs> awesome. It was a circle. And, and the third... <laughs> but you did it. Yeah. And the third thing is, I, I, I was hoping maybe we could be the... The picture for today. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, if everybody will uh, oblige. I, I was going to ask. So, oh, you don't have to do that. I'll take several, and then I'll piece it all together, and then I'll post it in seven months. Yeah.